More than 1,300 tech industry leaders, researchers, and others are now asking for a pause in the development of artificial intelligence to consider the risks. This is an incredibly important moment in history. A couple days ago, the Future of Life Institute published an open letter calling for the pause of giant AI experiments. The letter was signed by Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, who co-founded Apple, the CEO of Stability AI, which is what powers Stable Diffusion, many AI researchers at DeepMind, and many professors from MIT, Stanford, and beyond. Whether you're a tech enthusiast or you're an investor, this is just too important to ignore. So as somebody who's worked on AI research at MIT and might have a little bit of insight into what's going on, I thought I'd walk you through what this letter is and what it could mean for the future of AI. Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. AI systems with human competitive intelligence can pose profound risks to society and humanity, as shown by extensive research and acknowledged by top AI labs. Advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on Earth, and should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. Unfortunately, this level of planning and management is not happening even though recent months have seen AI labs locked in an out of control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict, or reliably control. Should we let machines flood our news and social media with propaganda or untruth? Let me add some context here. A lot of these GPT powered chatbots don't cite their sources and even if they do, most people don't bother fact checking them. That's a real problem because these generative models can hallucinate, which is where they start with a coherent answer, but can take a wrong turn and end up making something up, typically by combining multiple answers in a nonsensical way. This is a plot from OpenAI showing how factually accurate different GPT models are by category, like learning, technology, math, code, and business. The plot shows that GPT-4 is actually around 40% more factually accurate than GPT-3.5 but it still has a long way to go before it should be trusted. It's almost never over 80% accurate, which means one in every four to five answers are just flat out wrong. That's what makes it so scary that over 100 million people began using the service just two months after it came out. Should we automate away all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? Should we risk loss of control over our civilization? These questions sound really scary, but there isn't as much fear mongering going on here as you might think. Just a couple days ago, OpenAI released a paper where they investigated the impacts of large language models like GPT-4 on the labor market. The study revealed that around 80% of the US workforce will have at least 10% of their tasks affected by large language models, and that 19% of workers will see at least 50% of their job impacted. And when you add in software and tooling like chat interfaces, one button image generators, speech to text, and so on, that number skyrockets to around 50% of all job related tasks. The paper concludes that these GPT models exhibit the disruptive traits of general purpose technologies like electricity, computers, the internet, and smartphones, and so on. Think about the massive impact that these technologies have had in every aspect of society and definitely on business. That's what we're talking about with GPT-4 and beyond. OpenAI's paper also breaks down which jobs have more exposure to the kinds of tasks that GPT-4 can handle. Now, to be clear, that could mean that GPT-4 can make parts of these jobs easier to free up time and scale up people's productivity, not simply that it'll replace everyone who has these jobs in the first place. I won't read you the whole table, but here's the big trend. The most exposed jobs are the ones where you need to follow a strict set of rules like tax preparation, accounting, mathematics, or administrative assistance. If this happens, do that. That makes sense since GPT-4 can be taught rules and will reliably follow them. Programming languages, tax codes, mathematical operations, those are all rules heavy jobs. Jobs with lower exposure need more human interpretation. Survey researchers, public relations, marketing strategists, graphic designers, financial and investment managers. That's because there's some qualitative human element to these positions that large language models can't always understand. Even though a large part of the arts is getting automated with mid-journey, somebody still has to make the subjective decision around what the right graphic actually will be. Likewise, the least exposed jobs are the most physical, like agricultural equipment operators, athletes, equipment installers, mechanics, cooks, roofers, butchers, stonemasons, and so on. 
But the conclusion of this study is pretty clear. Many millions of jobs are about to change in a big way because of this technology, just like they did because of computers, the internet, and the smartphone. And that's why this letter calls for at least a six-month pause on the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. This pause should be public and verifiable, and include all key actors. If such a pause cannot be enacted quickly, governments should step in and institute a moratorium. Society has hit pause on other technologies with potentially catastrophic effects before. For example, human cloning, human germline modification, gain-of-function research, and eugenics. The letter clarifies that this doesn't mean a pause on AI development in general, but merely a stepping back from the dangerous race to ever-larger, unpredictable black-box models with emergent capabilities. AI research and development should be refocused on making today's powerful, state-of-the-art systems more accurate, safe, interpretable, transparent, robust, aligned, trustworthy, and loyal. And the letter ends with this. Humanity can enjoy a flourishing future with AI. Having succeeded in creating powerful AI systems, we can now enjoy an AI summer, in which we reap the rewards, engineer these systems for the clear benefit of all, and give society a chance to adapt. So now that you have some high-level context for this letter, including things like the actual accuracy rate of GPT-4, and how many jobs it could potentially disrupt, let's chat about the letter itself. When I first read it, I thought it was actually pretty emotionally charged, but then I realized that was the whole point of the letter, to appeal to the people wanting progress and not the machines that we all rely on to get it. My problem with the letter now is pretty different, because I don't think that we can get the scientific community or regulators to agree on what progress is allowed and what progress isn't. For example, the letter says that research and development should be refocused on making today's systems more accurate and more safe. But one of the best ways to do that is by upgrading the model itself. By the way, if you could just speak to the leap from uh, GPT-4 to GPT-4 from 3.5 from 3, is there some technical leaps or is it really focused on the uh, alignment? No, it's a lot of technical leaps in the base model. One of the things we are good at at OpenAI is finding a lot of small wins and multiplying them together. It looks like to the outside, like, oh, they just probably like did one thing to get from three to 3.5 to four. It's like hundreds of complicated things. So a tiny little thing with the training, with the, like everything, with the data organization. Yeah, how we like collect the data, how we clean the data, how we do the training, how we do the optimizer, how we do the architect, like so many things. And on the flip side, GPT-4 is already really advanced. This model can already do tons of damage with the right plugins, prompts, and jailbreaks. I'm not trying to naysay the spirit of the letter. I'm just pointing out that there needs to be a lot more specifics. Instead of limiting that training, we should focus on the actual problem, which is that we don't really understand how these large language models work. They're mostly black boxes. For example, Microsoft recently held a talk where they explained how their in-app co-pilots will work at a high level. They take your prompt and layer in the relevant information that they have on you, your content, and your interactions with other people, like emails and Teams messages. Then they use that information to actually modify the prompt that goes out to the large language model. Then the large language model does its thing and sends the response back to the Microsoft Graph, where it goes through a whole bunch of checks, things like AI safety, compliance, privacy reviews, and so on. Then once it clears all of that, the user finally gets the response. So here are some small suggestions that align with the intent of the open letter. Let's enforce transparency across the board. Each app should make it clear what information is being used in each prompt, kind of like how Apple's App Store will show you what data each app wants to use before you install it. Then you should be able to toggle access to individual pieces of that data on and off. In the Microsoft example, maybe this means being able to tell Copilot not to read your Teams chats, or your emails from a specific person, or when you're talking about a specific topic. Outside of work, it might mean knowing whether or not Bing Chat uses your browsing history and being able to turn that feature on and off. <laughs> I know plenty of people who would want that button right away. These apps should also explain how they modify the prompts. Right now, you can see your phone autocorrect as you type, but we don't really have any insight into what corrections are getting made after you hit enter in ChatGPT. Just like we can turn autocorrect on and off or tell it to ignore certain words, ugh, I'm not typing duck, we should be able to toggle whether the AI uses our original prompt or attempts to modify it and how. And there needs to be way more emphasis on citing sources. 
When an output is generated, the top few sources should be clearly displayed, and we should be able to request long form citations to show the exact parts of each source that was used. That way we can all have some more clarity around how and when GPT-4 is getting things wrong, and why it's making those mistakes under the hood. That way we can do what this letter is suggesting in the first place, which is to increase the accuracy without building a much more powerful model, and to increase transparency. Whatever happens, I hope it happens soon because it's about to get a lot cheaper to train these large AI models when Nvidia's H100 chips hit the market. Nvidia's current A100 GPUs are designed for the most demanding workloads in data centers, including machine learning and deep learning applications. They're built on Nvidia's Ampere architecture and are designed to scale very easily. Data centers can easily deploy multiple A100 GPUs to work together in parallel, allowing for even faster processing of large data sets, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Except Nvidia's newer H100 data center chips are a massive step up from the A100s in terms of performance. They're promising an up to a 9x speed up in AI training and a whopping 30x speed up for inference models like GPT-4. That means Nvidia's hardware is enabling the training for much bigger models at the same price, which is exactly what this open letter is warning against. So if OpenAI ends up designing the software that takes over the world, then Nvidia designed the hardware that it ran on. And speaking of Nvidia's hardware, I've been running a giveaway over the last couple weeks where one lucky winner gets an RTX 4080 Founders Edition graphics card, and 10 more winners will win credits for their Deep Learning Institute. And yes, I do see the irony of giving away a GPU in a video talking about the dangers of AI. The giveaway was officially sponsored by Nvidia, and they supplied all the prizes directly. Anyone who signed up got a chance to win, and anybody who used my link to attend at least one panel or a session during GTC and supplied a screenshot of their attendance got 10 additional entries. There were over 600 entries, and over 200 people ended up attending at least one GTC panel. That's awesome. If you want to get in on the next giveaway, or you want to get exclusive access to some of the cool AI and investing projects that I'm working on, fill out my quick survey and I'll make sure to notify you when things happen. The link to that survey can be found in the description below. Either way, here's a quick clip of me drawing the winners at random, and I'll be following up with them via email to hand out prizes over the next week. All right, so what I did real quick was I copied everybody who entered the contest into wheelofnames.com, which is an automatic random name picker. And then for everybody who supplied proof of attending at least one GTC panel, I took their name and I copied it in 10 times. So in total, you have one chance to win if you filled out my survey, and you have 10 additional chances to win if you provided proof that you attended at least one GTC conference. The first 10 winners will get a credit each to NVIDIA's Deep Learning Institute, so a DOI credit, and then the 11th name will win the RTX 4080 Founders Edition GPU. And just so you know, if you get picked as a winner for something, all instances of your name get removed so that you can't win multiple times. So good luck to everyone who entered, and here are your 11 winners. Congratulations, Davey, on your DLI credit. Congratulations, Aaron. Congratulations, Benedict. Congratulations, Rick. Congratulations, Jan. Congratulations, Samuel. Congratulations, Barga. Congratulations, Marius. Congratulations, Yoni. Congratulations, Alejandro, on your Deep Learning Institute credit. And now, let's go draw the name of the lucky winner for the RTX 4080 Founders Edition graphics card. And the lucky winner is... Shushant, I'll be reaching out to make sure that I get your address and all the details so that I can send you your RTX 4080 graphics card. Congratulations, and I'm really excited to connect with you and send you your prize. This giveaway was a ton of fun, and a huge thank you to NVIDIA for making it happen. Remember to check out my survey linked in the description below if you want to get exclusive access to some of the cool AI and investing projects that I'm working on. I'm really excited to share them with you. But before you go investing your hard-earned money into AI companies and the hardware platforms that power them, there's one more big disruption that you need to know about. So make sure to check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. That lets me know to share more content like this. Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. 
My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.